Okay, welcome back to unit uh, four. On unit four, we're going to be, we talked already about in our art history lecture, we talked about the transition from late Christian all the way to the Gothic. And in our art medium lecture, we are going to cover architecture. And architecture is a pretty big topic and uh, some of the most important artwork, you know, in his, when people study art history, they study a lot of buildings partially because buildings tend to last um, whereas lots of other th other things like uh, uh, paintings don't last nearly as well and so we have much more of a clear continuity when it comes to um, making buildings and also because um, buildings are things that people invest you know cultures cities or, or groups of people invest a lot into so there's a lot to talk about, but we're going to kind of simplify it. And the structure of this lecture is going to basically start with one point of view, which is thinking about architecture as metaphor, um, starting with kind of the idea of what the metaphors of the most ancient people would have been looking at um, uh, sacred spaces in architecture. And then we cover, we start covering kind of the history of architecture from the point of view of engineering in a way, from the point of view of load bearing. How do buildings do what they do? How do they get bigger, span larger spaces, get higher, right? Um, so basically like, you know, just the development from post and lintel to more complex forms of post and lintel to arches to, so that's another part of the story. And then we start to think about the, um, another part of this is thinking about what is, what is the purpose of architecture? Or maybe another way to think about it is, what is it that makes architecture not just a building, not just a utilitarian space, but when does architecture become art? And, and, and when do we, and, and therefore, what are the experiences of architecture that are, are the most important or meaningful? And, and then by the time we come to the end of the lecture and we're talking about um, architecture of the last 20 years, we kind of wrap all of those things together. So we might be able to do it in two parts, maybe in three parts. So the first thing I want to cover is when we think about ancient architecture, we should first mostly just, we should think about how ancient people, when they started to build sacred spaces, right? Sacred architectural spaces that they were using already natural sacred spaces as their models. Um, and this is, Pretty clear um, but you know you can you can look at a lot of different examples of it but when we look at something like a ziggurat or a pyramid certainly um, you know you think of of mountains although whether the Egyptians were thinking of mountains because we're not really sure how much the Egyptians were even aware of, of like of that but um, certainly you know that's one metaphor that seems likely but also in Egyptian art, the sacred cave seems to be a very important metaphor. Lots of funerary temples that then are built into the side of walls and become, um, are on the exterior, not, you know, they become kind of like palaces, but as they go inward, they become like these cave sort of spaces. Interestingly enough, um, the Parthenon kind of combines all of these things in a way. The Parthenon sits on top of an Acropolis, right? Which is a center hill in Athens. And so it's kind of like, a a mountain in that way. It is like a sacred grove, as in a lot of column-based architectures like a sacred grove or like um, the Stonehenge is like a sacred grove. But if you walk up to the Parthenon, you follow the way up along up the Acropolis, you will pass numerous sacred caves along the way. So in that one space in the Acropolis, we have um, all three of those metaphors combined. So let's talk a little bit about structure, how, how spaces are made. And so the simplest form of architectural load bearing is post and lintel, right? It's simply two posts, right? Two things that stand upright and one thing that goes across it. This is how every kid who knows how to make a fort begins their idea of building spaces, right? You build some, some things that stand and then things that go across those things. And this basic structure is the same. Right? This is post and lintel, right? And this is post and lintel, and this is post and lintel. Post and lintel can get much more complex, right? Um, there can be a lot more thought into how to make sure that those distances that are spanned, uh, that you can span really 
wide distances. A lot more thought about how to ensure that columns can go really, you know, to great heights. Um, if we look at the columns of, um, of ancient Greece, like let's say the columns of the Parthenon, these are drum columns. They're not a single piece of stone carved out, but instead they're carved into pieces, right? And then the drums are stacked and the drums are, are attached to each other with um, types of joining material. They used molten lead um, as a means of joining all the pieces to each other, uh, which is pretty amazing. And so here we have much greater spaces spanned, but it's still the basic principle, right? Um, as beautiful as this is, and as, as much as it stands out, this is still and here as well, right? Pergamon altar, this is all um, basically post lintel architecture. But then we also have in the in the late uh, classical period into the Hellenistic period, we start to see the adoption of the arch, but it wasn't until the Romans that we see archways becoming a really important part of public architecture and including even sacred architecture. And you know, one of the advantages of an arch is that it can span even greater distances and it can bear more weight. Um, there's a famous quote that's attributed to Leonardo da Vinci that he once said that an archway is two weaknesses that create a strength, right? Because these two weaknesses lean into each other, right? The two halves of the arch, right? They would either way would fall, but when they lean into each other, then they create a strength because they take all the weight that's here in the center and they push it out to be, to be supported by the columns. And once you, once you basically understand the principle of an arch, right, as, a, as an architect, you can then take that to any number of directions. You can build vaults and you can build domes. And domes were some, uh, an, a part of Roman architecture, um, not really used much in the classical world or the Hellenistic world, but a major part of Roman architecture. And really all that a dome is, is an archway that is rotated, you know, around a center point 180 degrees i say it's all that is but it's not that simple right just, but um so here we have the the pantheon and not to be confused with the parthenon and in the pantheon we have um this big giant dome with an oculus in the center um which is basically like the you know the eye of, of the heavens it is the 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 title pantheon which means basically like temple of all the gods is not actually a, a, the name for this space that we that we know the Romans called it. It's more kind of a nickname um, because it, it seemed to be the, the, the point of the space. A little, little side note here just to emphasize the influence of some of these ancient, uh, ancient pieces of architecture. So we just finished talking about the Romanesque and Gothic. And so now I want you to think about how um, how Romanesque architecture fits into this, this structure, right? The use of arches as a way of raising up the space. And then as we move um, into later periods, right? Um, whether it's in Islamic architecture or later into late uh, Romanesque and, and Gothic architecture, we see this desire to use arch, arches and repeated arches and different forms of vaulting to go higher and higher, right? So these are like series of arches that are, are supporting each other and creating more open spaces and also creating ceilings that are going higher and higher. So here's some examples um, from saint Senan and where else? Uh, oh yeah, from Compostela. So, um, and here's some examples of, of Romanesque vaulting. Uh, that was my one minute mark, so probably be wrapping up pretty close. Let's finish on this page. So here is kind of like a sums up a lot of the structures we've been talking about. A barrel vault, right? Which is one of the things we see at St. Saint Anne, right? Which is just a straight vault where, vault where it's an archway extended in one direction all the way. We have rib vaults, which are where, and you can have a rib vaulting on a barrel vault, right? All it means is that there's reinforcement along certain edges. Right, that's all that ribbing is. And then you combine a ribbed vault into a groin vault. A groin vault starts out just where you have an intersection of two passageways at a, at a right angle. 
Uh, but we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Okay, 